Hello everyone! In this video I'm going to talk to you guys about heteroscedasticity, but in this video in particular I'm going to talk, deal with a case where um, heteroscedasticity has been detected. In the last video heteroscedasticity was not detected, but in this video we're going to talk about a case where heteroscedasticity will be detected and thus what ways we could uh, fix heteroscedasticity. So, the very classic example from uh, macroeconomics and marketing modeling is the food spending relationship versus the income. So there is a relationship between um, how much income you're making, the more income you're making maybe uh, affects the how much money you're spending on food. So basically the first step in linear uh, regression analysis is for us to um, to do the scatter plot. We start with the uh, y variable, and then go data. Uh, sorry, go insert, and here we go. But this is not how we uh, uh, finish the plot. Let's take it a little bit to the top. In fact, we would like to make sure that the x-axis is actually taking the right values. The series of x values is, is indeed the income without the label. And then the series name is food spending versus income, correct? And now here's the plot. Now this is the right shape. Over here, maybe this is a bit crowded. So let's format the axes in this uh, here, I would like to format the axes with a custom angle, right? And over here, I'm going to put it minus 20 and see how, yeah, this is better for visibility. And now I would like to add a trend line. This is, we've been doing this for quite a while now. So here, trend line. So we can see that from this trend line, the uh, income explains all, all about 65% uh, of the variation of food spending. Let's just add the axes here. This is income and this is food spending. Right. So now we should be ready to uh, I lost my trend line, unfortunately. Let's uh, just make sure the trend line is in a color that we can see easily. Maybe a brighter yellow. Yeah. Okay. All right, here's the equation. Okay, and now let's run linear regression in any case. So I'm going to put the results of linear regression. Probably I, I, I like to keep some space here and add the, the plot on this side so that I would have the enough space on the other side for the linear regression investigation. Okay, so now this is this should be fine. Okay. So now let's start with the linear regression investigation. We go to data, of course, go to data analy analysis and go to regression. Choose the y axis with the label if you want, food spending. But in this case, do not forget to check the labels over here. And the x also, since you, you, you're going to select with the labels, be consistent with the x and y. And over here, residuals we need, residuals uh, plots, and we are going to line up the results here. So here is the output. With the output, the first thing we do is to comment on the goodness of fit of the model. And we comment on that by the adjusted R square or R square. If the model is simple regression, then R square is OK. But let's just take it as a habit and just look at both of them. This should be almost similar when it's simple regression analysis. So over here we can just say that um, the um, income, 
we usually say the model, uh, and here the model involves or includes only one independent variable. So the model or income explains uh, about 65% of, of the variation of the dependent variable, which is uh, the variation of food spending. Then the second uh, thing to do is to comment on the, the uh, uh, precision or accuracy. And over here, we use the, uh, the standard error. As for me, I told you guys, in, if you want to be very, um, um, uh, very proper, I would say, you, um, you would want to test for both the uh, two standard errors and one standard error away. So basically, you would want to hope that about 95% of the uh, residuals lie in within two standard errors and about 68% of the residuals lie in within one standard error so that you can see how this works. Let's, let's just for fun this time take a look at how the residuals actually... Um, and, and, and before we do this, how about we actually uh, add here a column on the absolute errors. So let's just cut these and paste them somewhere else. Hopefully this is the standard error. This is two times the standard error. Good. And how about this is the absolute residuals? Okay. Over here with the absolute residuals, basically we're just going to do ABS. Use the ABS function to do the absolute to get the absolute value to strip out the uh, sign. And over here we're just going to do if this value is less than or equal this value, return one. Else return zero. This means that if the uh, residual point is in within that bound, in within one standard error, uh, return one, else return zero. So that when we sum it, we can get the sum of all the values that satisfy the condition. And then we can divide over the number of uh, cells or the, the total number of the population and then we can find out the percentage. So over here let's find out the percentages. Over here the sum of all these guys over the count of the same range gives us how many points are within one uh, standard error. So as you can see here, if we put it in percentage and have one, it's not 68% of the points, it's 66% of the points are in within one standard error, are lie within one standard error, while one standard error, and over here, uh, sum of this one over over the count on the same range or over the same range and this guys will be the percentage of errors that lie in within two standard errors and as you can see we have Okay, let me just start in a new line here. 95% lie within two standard errors. So usually we take this into consideration, especially if this number does not match the 68%. Uh, but it's not very bad. It's 68. It's not a very bad number. Um, usually I ask you guys to just uh, look the look up the value of or the percentage of the residuals that lie in within one is two standard errors and that's is sufficient so this is the goodness of fit 
then we move into the ANOVA to check whether or not we are going to uh, reject the null hypothesis. Reject the null hypothesis of no linearity. So this hypothesis, the null hypothesis here of the ANOVA F test, uh, it stipulates that uh, altogether all the variables in the model uh, does not support linearity, do not actually uh, demonstrate a linear relationship with the dependent variable. So when this value, the p-value or the significance f value is less than the threshold, and this thre threshold is 0 0.05, corresponds to 95% confidence in our judgment. So we're 95% confident that uh, uh, only about, this is E minus 14 means we have 14 digits to the left of the decimal point. So this is a very small number um, out of like uh, more than a million or a billion that this is not, 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 does not hold true. So in any case, we reject the null hypothesis of no linearity. This means that it is linear. There is a linearity is established. Now we go over the uh, the model that the the coefficient here and it is its p value. The p value also is less than the threshold 0.05, which means that the uh, the uh, independent variable or the income uh, variable is significant. But now, given that, so my students always understand that they have to add given that the uh, linear model assumptions are validated. So if the assumptions are not validated, we have every reason to doubt. We will have a reason to doubt that this value is reliable, all right? And I want to interpret the coefficients here because we're not sure still if the linear model assumptions are validated. So let's validate the linear model assumptions. The first assumption, guys, is the assumption of assumption of linearity. Uh, sorry, the normality, the assumption of normality of the error terms. So first of all, we need to find the skewness and the kurtosis. But also, I'd like to take a look at the plot. So this is the residual plot. Let's make it a little bigger. Let's examine this plot. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Let's take a look here at the axes. Let's just format it a little so that we can, can better see. There's minus 20. And it's all right. Let me just take a look. Is it random? Does it look random to you? Does it look like there is no... Um, no patterns well i can see here that the span the uh, range of the values the lower and the upper ranges of the spread uh, of these residuals versus income actually not consistent not constant over here this area over here the range is a bit smaller as we are moving forward compared to this at the very end of the data, meaning as the income value increases, as we are moving forward here on the x-axis, seems like the residuals also increase. Uh, basically, this is, a, this is guys, a, 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 a negative residual, but the distance here, the, the, the value itself increases, isn't it? So, well, uh, this is uh, a quite alarming. Uh, so let's also check the skewness and the kurtosis. So here the skewness is, uh, sorry, the skewness of the uh, the, uh, the the residuals with the sign. All right, a skew, and here is the kurtosis of the residuals with the sign, not the absolute residuals. And over here we can find the the skewness and the kurtosis being outside the range of the uh, linear regression. Um, let me show you the, just the, the reference table that I 
gu guide my students to um, here. So we have a sample size of over 100. So 100 or over, these are the ranges within 95% confidence intervals for the skewness and the kurtosis of a data drawn from a normal random variable. So this is a normal random variable. So this is the lower, the upper, the lower and the upper, the lower and the upper. And as you can see, uh, our values lie outside this range. So let me just copy the table for now. line up everything nicely. So as you can see here, we have the skewness being 0 0.1, uh, 1. So it is in within this range. And uh, the kurtosis is outside the range. This is 0 0.71. And this is 0 0.74. So this is outside the range. So for this purpose, we have every reason, a little reason to actually a bit doubt the normal distribution. So this is also a sign here, a very bad sign. So the kurtosis is a bit outside the range. Yeah. How many, how many observations do we have? We just need to make sure that, oh, we have 56. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. We have 56 observations. I thought that we have 100 observations. So if we have 56 observations, in this case, we need to follow different, um, uh, between 50 and 60 so over here the ranges are different so the ranges are in between let's say if it's 60 which is the, the, the more than what we got 0 0.61 for the skewness and 0 0.62 even if it's 50 we go by the 50 0 0.67 uh, so and 0 0.66 so this actually in within the range how about the kurtosis on the other hand the kurtosis is also minus 0 0.91 or minus 0 0.85 and 1.49, so it's in within the range. So this is okay, all right? I'm sorry, guys. I was looking at 100 and more, thinking that our observations, the number is 100, but it's actually 56. So since our observation is about, our observations is um, 56, we have here, uh, 56 uh, observations so we have to look at this range all right okay so we have no reason to doubt the normal random distribution of the residuals good good let's move forward now is this data set cross-sectional or uh, time series Obviously, there's no time data here, so it's not time series. It is cross-sectional. All right, so we need to just look up two more assumptions, which are uh, heat rose elasticity test and also the multi-correlation. Multi-collinearity, I'm sorry, multi-collinearity. All right, for heat rose elasticity test, let's start with the plotting the uh, absolute residuals versus the predicted values. And I, I have um, talked about this, right? I've talked about this in the previous video. So I'm just going to go ahead and do the visual representation here. Let's take it up. All right, line it here. Make sure, guys, when you are plotting the uh, absolute residuals that you also visit the design tab select data and edit and make sure you fill in uh, the series x the series x here is the predicted food is pending and then why not add a series name which is the uh, absolute absolute error terms versus predicted spending or predicted food spending and this is it as you can see here now we have a better view of it 
let's guys add as I always say it's a it's the best thing to add the access titles here this is the predicted or over here you can just uh, add the equal sign and go to the label this is the predicted food spending oh, what happened <laughs> okay let me just Okay, it won't. Ah, so that's what happened. Okay, so let me just try to. Okay, so over here, it's equal to. It should work. I hope it works. Let's. Yeah, it worked. I just didn't need to hit the enter key. And over here, the same way, is equal to the absolute error, which is over here, the absolute residuals. And here we go. So now, guys, I have the predicted errors versus the absolute residuals. Let's now see what happens. Do you think that there is a linear correlation, a strong linear cor correlation over here? And it's a very difficult question to answer indeed but i feel that the line is not flat more it's more going upward and seems like predicted food spending is responsible 32 percent of the of explaining the variance in the absolute residuals in this case i will go ahead and work with the um probably with the uh, push and pagan test so with the uh, Prusch Pagan test, what we will do is we will run a linear regression of the absolute errors. Uh, actually, it's a chi-square test. Sorry, uh, this one is different. It's a chi-square test. It's a chi-square test, and it's equal to n times the r square. So we need to run a linear regression, but this time our linear regression is with the uh, multiple or, or square errors. So we're going to have to plot the square errors versus the predicted food spending. Um, I'm going to, for, for limitation, space limitation, usually with my students, I just work with the two standard errors. So I just didn't leave enough space here. For this purpose, I'm just going to add here. Oh, sorry, why am I I'm in the wrong cell? Okay. So I'm going to add here the residuals square. And I'm just going to square the residuals. So this is square times itself. Easy. And this is the square residuals or residuals squared. And now I can run linear regression uh, between the residual squared and the income. So I'm going to go to data, data analysis. Of course, I explained this with for you guys in the previous video. So the y here is the residuals squared and the x here is the independent variable income. I wonder if I actually included the labels. Did I include the labels? I didn't, right? So I don't have to check the labels here. And I don't need these. And actually the output range, I'm going to line it up under here. Let's hope everything goes well. Yes. So now let's find the value with the R square, which is equal to 
over here is equal to the count, which is the total number of values here. It's 56. I know it's 56, but well, let's just make sure that there is no room for error. So we have 56 as the total number of observations. And this we multiply it by the R square. And then we need to find the P value. So the P value here will be equal to chi square distribution RT. We take this value and we take the degree of freedom. Degree of freedom is the number of independent variables and it's only one. So in this case, as you can see guys, actually it is less than 0 0.05. So this is less than 0 0.05. This means that we reject the null hypothesis of no hetero, het, 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 heteroscedasticity. This means the model suffers from non-constant error term or heteroscedasticity. So what does that mean? This means that this p-value could not be validated. This means that such a model as uh, y is equal to, where is it? y is equal to, which is y is the spending, food spending, predicted food spending is equal to um, the, the, uh, the intercept 1,270 uh, plus 0.1478x, uh, which is the income, is, 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 is not reliable. It's not, it's not uh, reliable as a good linear model. And uh, so that it cannot predict with a reliability and a confidence. We cannot use it. Why? Because the error terms at the lower values of uh, income, uh, those who receive less income, the model has uh, lower um, um, residual values compared to those who are um, earning higher income. So once we want to predict the uh, food spending for those who are earning more money, this model will not be as precise when compared to when we want to use it to predict the food spending for those who earn less because the residuals increasing along the linear model, along the predicted values. Yeah, because of that. Okay, so now that we have uh, heteroscedasticity, there are ways to work around heteroscedasticity. How can we... So because of this heteroscedasticity, I'm not going to waste my time and actually uh, check the, um, the multicollinearity. So over here, there are two ways to work around heteroscedas uh, heteroscedasticity. Yeah. Uh, as I explained in my notes, guys, the first way is uh, is it transforming the y variable to the linear, uh, sorry, not linear, this is natural logarithm, or to take the square root. So let's, let's work with the first one is the linear logarithm of y. And let's take this again and work with it with the square root, I'm going to just put it like that, of y. I'm sorry, we, we transformed this one. This is the y. So over here, I'm going to just put len y, uh, food spending again. And let's take the linear, the, the natural logarithm of y. I'm sorry guys if I'm a bit uh, calling things with different names because I'm a bit, it's a bit late here. 
So it's been a long day also. So anyway, so this is the natural logarithm of y. As you can see, let's plot this versus this and see the difference. So this one we plotted already over here. Yeah. So let's see how this plot is different. Okay. So let's take this food spending as natural logarithm. Insert over here. Do not guys forget to add the X series, which is the income. And now just put natural logarithm. Pop, 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 pop. Of dependent variable. I'm just going to put it as dp as dependent variable. Otherwise, we're going to get a very long name. Let me just take it up, put it here. Okay. So, um, as you can see, here is a, a little difference. Mm -hmm. And I have a trend line and here's this a new equation with different totally different uh, intercepts and coefficient okay let's investigate the model here, the linear model, and taking the y to be the natural logarithm. Let's take the labels as well. And then the x to be the food spend, uh, the uh, income. Labels are there, residuals and residuals plots. And let's put the output over here. Oh, 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 I should cancel by mistake. Oh, my. Uh, I, 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 uh, I like trust now. Okay, let's do it again. The Y is the natural logarithm with the labels. And we can get the output over here. All right, so now we have the output. I'm going to just run over it very quickly. I want to just to check for the normality of the assumptions, not the goodness of fit for now. You can check the goodness of fit uh, later with the adjusted R squared or the, um, uh, the R square and the standard error. Uh, over here is okay, and over here already the p-value is okay. It's less than 0. Point, uh, so over here, let me just 0 0.05. Over here is less than 0 0.05, but let's do the normality assumption of the residuals as well as the heteroscedasticity. So for this purpose, I'm going to get the residuals uh, square. And this would be this times this. And now we can run the normality assumption first. Normality and random normal distribution of error terms through skewness and kurtosis. So over here, we're going to do skew. And we take the residuals with their sign, right? Their kurtosis, we do the curt. Same thing. And let's take a look at the table from the previous. I uh, here. So let's take this as a guide. 
So over here you can see that this cuneus is in between the values, yeah, it's in within the range. How about the kurtosis? The kurtosis is also in within, barely in within the range. If we look at the 50, they are 56, you can see 0 0.85, this is minus 0 0.852. You can say it's maybe around the 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 the, the border line. So over here, let's talk about heteroskedasticity test. For the heteroskedasticity test, we can take the the absolute residuals. So we need the absolute residuals. I'm going to put the absolute residuals here <coughs> versus the predicted values. So over here we can use the ABS function to get the magnitude of the residuals only and now we can insert oh wow that was quick and then not to forget to add the X series which is here the predicted values. The series name could be the heteroskedasticity test. And this is it. Wow. All right. So let's take it down a little. So this is first the visual depiction. <coughs> I'm sorry. And here is basically the predicted and here basically this is the absolute errors. And now let's take a look. It seems like there is no linear linear uh, line, meaning the absolute errors do not necessarily increase as the predicted spending in increase. Like as the predicted spending increase, the error terms are in within almost the same range. Um, despite little outliers over here, they're almost in within the same range. So if you even add a linear model here, a linear line, you will see that your linear line is quite flatty. It's not uh shooting up or shooting down and you can see the r squared which is the percentage that the predicted food spending explains the variation in the absolute error is so low it is like uh 0 0.8 percent uh, 0 0.8 percent yeah uh, of the uh so it it just explains so little of the variation, the absolute error. So this is a very uh, good and nice uh, uh, evidence that there is no heteroscedasticity. Yeah, but if you want to keep going with the Proust Pagan test, if you want to do the test you have here the residual squared we have them ready and you want to do the correlation here the I'm sorry the regression you want to run the regression and the y is the residuals squared do not take the labels now so let's not take the labels and the input is the x it's the income and since we didn't take the um, the labels we don't need these either and let's set up the output here to start here. All right, so now we have the output. So the, the chi square here is equal to n times the r square. And this would be equal to, I always like to go count. However, I know that they are 56, but Let's do it religiously correct. So this is the number of observations multiplied by the R square over here, very little value. 
and then now we need to give the p-value of this value of this measure which is chi square distribution rt and then we feed into there this value and we have only one independent variable as a degree of freedom uh, you can see here uh, basically the value in fact is Mm. So it seems like this value is not less than 0 0.05. So this value is not uh, 0 0.05, is greater than 0 0.05. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This means the null hypothesis of no heteroskedasticity is accepted, which is a desirable situation. So there is no evidence of heteroskedasticity. So at the end, there is no evidence of heteroskedasticity. So now that we have no evidence of heteroskedasticity because we transformed the the variable here, the food is spending into the natural logarithm, this made a difference. Now we don't have an evidence of heteroscedasticity. Even if we, I forgot to just look at the randomness of the variables of the, of the, uh, of the residuals. But in any case, we can now move ahead to test for multi-collinearity, right? So with multicollinearity, what happens is we want to check if there is uh, any correlation among the independent variables, but actually we have only one independent variable in this case. So multicollinearity is usually a test for multiple regression analysis, so we were not going to run multicollinearity here. However, for um, multi information about how to do the multicollinearity test, you can just uh, take a look at the previous video that we talked about different assumptions of linear regression. Now let's talk about a different transformation. Let's talk about the square root of y. Let's take a look at this transformation. So basically we want to transform all these guys to the square, square root. then why not just visually see the difference, make sure that the x-axis is actually the income, and then we have the square root, oh man, transformation of the dependent variable. Very good. Let's add here. This is equal to this. Oh, I'm sorry. This is equal. I hope that I haven't made a, a mistake in the previous. This is income. Let me let me just check the previous graph, the plot. Oh, I didn't add the, the, the axes here. That's bad. Here's the income, but it's obviously the income because of the currency. Over here is the currency also is an indication that this is the income. But just in any case, I, I always worry. And uh, today been a long day and it's a long night as well for me. Okay, let's get this done here. Okay, wait a minute. Let's expand this. And here we go. Very good, very good. So look at this compared to this. This is the original with no transformation. And this is with the square root transformation. Let's add here a trend line and take a look roughly at the measures. So over here we have uh, R squared being 0 0.668 
and this is the um, the best linear model however let's check for heteroscedasticity if it's gone or not for this purpose let's start with data analysis regression take the y-axis to be the transformed yeah the transformed uh, values well let's take the labels no problem and over here is the income again and labels are taken residuals why not and this is where we would like the output to be dumped into the page and here we go so first of all we need to comment on the goodness of fit but for time limitations i'm just going to highlight the two more, most important measures for the goodness of fit the significance here this is this value is absolutely less than uh, 0 0.05 this means that we can reject the null hypothesis of no linearity because i just put it for simplicity here i put no linearity all right and over here p value is also less than 0 0.05 however they are only significant if the um, um, the uh, assumptions of linearity are hold true all right uh, uh, so now let's do the absolute error of residuals <coughs> this is for the visual investigation of heteroscedasticity and take the residuals square which is also for uh, de de detection of heteroscedasticity using the push pagan test <clears throat> over here we take the square errors right and now first of all we need to begin with a normal I'm not the assumption that the error terms our withdrawal come from a random normal distribution is that true okay let's test that so we do the skewness test and the kurtosis test okay okay and we take the residuals with their signs negative or positive and this we take the kurtosis with their signs this residuals and then we need to look at the same table so over here we have 56 observations so these are the ranges skewness is in between skewness is in between this range is in within the range right and kurtosis is also in within the range oh no kurtosis in fact is not in within the range wait a minute no kurtosis is in, not in within the range you see the skewness here the skewness is minus 0 0.1 let's see minus 0 0.1 it's in within the range but kurtosis is not in within the range look at the kurtosis here it is not in within the range so the normality assumption is not validated we have a reason so we have a reason to doubt the normality assumption of the error term let's take a look here at the residuals they look random to me though here they looked almost the same all right so basically we're not going to carry on with this transformation however just for the purpose of uh, technicalities would like to train you more on the heteroscedasticity test let's do the, uh, the the plotting of the absolute errors just so that we can uh, be trained more right over here the x would be the predicted values right. 
and here we can just name it it will just get us the city test let's get the graph and pull it up pull it up right here very good Maybe we start with the 60. And here is the predicted values, guys, right? And here is the Why is the predicted values here are different? Wait a minute. Okay, okay. Just a second. I, I think I... The absolute errors. Okay. So let me just make sure that everything is all right. Select data, edit. This x-axis series is actually the predicted spending. That's correct. So it's 109 and, 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 and so forth. So that's correct. And the Y series is in fact the absolute errors. That's correct. So yep, yeah, now it's a, it's, a, it's the right axis, right? So sometimes things happen. You just need to be um, making sure that you troubleshoot sometimes. Okay, so it seems like there's no heteroscedasticity though because it seems like there's, oh, actually, maybe I'm wrong. Here's a very um, nice <laughs> line. Let's color it up. So not all transformation does work. Over here, let's take a look. So it explains 13% of the variation. All right, nonetheless, let's do the Prush and Pagan test. this purpose let's run uh, data linear regression again but in this case we're going to take the y to be the uh, the y values to be the uh, residuals square and let me remember that I took the labels this time so I'm going to keep the labels checked and the x-axis is the independent variable and that is the income and I'm not going to need the residuals and the residual plots for now. And let me just put the output right here and hit OK. Let's take a look. At, OK. So over here, um, maybe it's a bad sign. In any case, let's do this. The pi square measure is n multiplied by the r square. And that is, since we know that it's 56, we've done this so many times. 56 multiplied by the r square. And then let's do the p value. The p value is chi square distribution rt. And you take this and one. And over here, this is the p-value. Uh -huh. And this p-value is less than 0 0.05. This means that we reject the null hypothesis of heteroscedasticity. The null hypothesis of no. Heteroscedasticity. This means heteroscedasticity, which is the non constant error term, exists. Non constant variance, actually. Non constant variance in error term exists. Yeah, so this is problematic. Here, a very nice linear. Line. This means as the predicted food spending values increases, 
the absolute errors also increases. And as you can see here also with the Prouge Pagan test, we were not uh, able to accept that there is no heteroscedasticity. So we had we failed to reject. So we uh, sorry we 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 actually what did I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. So over here, just again, over here, this value is actually less than 0 0.05. This means that we reject the null hypothesis of no heteroscedasticity, meaning there is heteroscedasticity. And then, then this a transformation in this case is not acceptable. But that doesn't mean that square root of y transformation is always unacceptable. Sometimes this transformation uh, actually yields a very nice uh, results of normal uh, <clears throat> for the normality assumption and also uh, uh, no heteroscedasticity. But in this case in particular, the uh, proper the proper transformation ended up being the natural logarithm. So basically, with this transformation, we cannot validate this significant value, and we are going to end up. Uh, working with a set of data with the natural logarithm of the y value so that we can get rid of the uh, uh, heteroscedasticity problem and get a flat linear line like this rather than a linear line that indicates a relationship or dependency of the absolute errors and the predicted food spending. All right, this is it for today. And uh, thank you so much. I'll let you go for now.